My name is Andrew Van Lint. I'm a haematology and medical registrar, and I'm here to talk to you about peptic ulcer. So let's uh, get into it. What is Molina? And even at a level of an intern and some residents, um, the understanding of exactly what is Molina and what is not is often uh, challenging. Um, I really enjoy gastro and I spent three times on there, so I got to really know Molina very well, somewhat intimately. Um, so real Molina is, it's black. It's not just dark, it's really very black. Um, and it, people often say it's somewhat tarry. It has a very offensive smell. Like people will say, this really stinks, really strongly, and it's really loose. So the best known laxative to man is blood. You can give whatever other laxatives you want. If there is blood, you cannot hold a firm stool if there's sufficient blood in there. And so Molina, therefore, is very, always loose. If someone says, I've got Molina, but they're really hard stools, it is not Molina, they're just dark stools, probably from iron or something else that you've eaten. Um, other people say as well that it often breaks into small pieces and it sticks to the, uh, the, ba the, the bowl um, and they find flushing doesn't always get rid of it first time. So some of those things are, are hints that you'll really know that you're dealing with Molina and that's representing partially digested blood. So you classically from the stomach from ulcers or the duodenum uh, or the jejunum. Once you get down into the colon, you deal with mixed blood in with the stool. It's still looking kind of red or dark red. And if it's fresh blood, when you wipe uh, from the anus, that is usually hemorrhoids or um, anal fissures that's causing that. So classic in this presentation, he felt this sudden urge to open his bowels and he passed a large amount of stool that was soft, sticky, again, that kind of idea of this tar, black and tarry and had a foul odour. So you can see that Ron is really having the main features of Molina and that kind of history is unmistakable in terms of Molina. So uh, don't get, out, get caught out. In terms of anemia, anemia can present lots of different ways and we see that in haematology. So the first sign of anemia is usually fatigue. They just feel generally tired, and le less energy kind of levels, a bit more sleepy sometimes. And then as it gets worse, they get this relative hypoxia because they're not having the same oxygen capacity. And so they start feeling short of breath, usually at le initially on exertion, so this exertional dyspnea. And when it gets worse, you get angina because you're not actually having enough oxygen carrying capacity and you get a relative hypoperfusion uh, to the heart itself. And that's particularly, again, on exertion. And if it gets to rest, you know you're dealing with something really serious. Then as you develop a hypovolemia, which is often related to acute blood loss rather than chronic, you'll get dizziness and you've got postural hypotension. And that's defined as a systolic greater than 20 difference from sitting to standing, or a, a diastolic greater than 10. Finally, if, if anemia is left, uh, whether chronically but particularly acutely, left unaddressed and you start get getting hemoglobins well below 70, you start getting tissue infarction because there just isn't enough perfusion happening. And that particularly can happen in myocardium, and that's called a type 2 MI because it's related to demand uh, with a lack of supply, and it can happen in brain tissue as well as other organs. But brain and heart need an ongoing supply. Other tissues can manage for a degree of, uh, of ischemia before they infarct, but it's really brain and myocardium that can happen. And classically in the brain tissue, you see um, that in extreme, when you've got a drop of blood pressure and significant anemia, you can get this watershed infarction, it's called. So moving on, uh, the Ron went for a, a procedure, an under, under endoscopy, um, and without apparent complications. So that's where usually with some sedation, um, a endoscopic um, uh, camera is passed through the mouth and then down the esophagus. You check the esophagus as you go down because sometimes you can have esophageal ulcers that bleed. And then you check the stomach and usually the first part of the duodenum. And then you'll either see gastric ulcers or duodenal ulcers, which occur in similar numbers. And you can see that's why they had a look. And then we treat it. So there's a number of ways you can treat uh, a bleeding ulcer, which isn't really important first year, but just for those people that are interested in a procedural ga uh, gastroenterology, you can treat it with a heater probe, so you're effectively cauterizing it. You can also inject adrenaline down an endoscopy as well, uh, and often the, the combination of those two are used, and then there's a couple of other probes. But if it gets really hard and it's still bleeding and you haven't been able to control it with adrenaline and a heater probe, usually that's a point that we start actually calling the surgeons in and they may then do um, a, a laparoscopic um, oversew of that particular part of the ulcer if required. So in terms of peptic ulcers, like how common is this? And I think it's important to realise that peptic ulcer is a broad category that includes duodenal ulcers and gastric ulcers, and I suppose it could also include lower esophageal um, ulcers in that group. So actually, duodenal ulcers are four times as common as gastric ulcers. And whenever I used to think of peptic ulcers, I used to always think of it bleeding in the stomach, 
And I was actually surprised when I went, okay, it's a ratio um, of four to one. That actually, most of the time, 80% of the time, you're gonna have these duodenal ulcers. However, the bleeding rates may be different between those two, but duodenal ulcers is mostly what we're dealing with. 10 to 20% of patients with gastric ulcers also have duodenal ulcers at the same time. And maybe that's not surprising because the same kind of causative factors are usually at play. Overall, there's a lifetime incidence of about 10%. Um, so it's a really common thing that 10% of people at one point in their lifetime will have a peptic ulcer, whether they're symptomatic or not, whether there's complications or not. And peptic ulcer disease can contribute up to 10% of hospital admissions. So it's worth getting your head around because this is something that everyone will see. In terms of etiology, um, there's a big role of Helicobacter pylori, and that's something that um, uh, our university particularly was um, famous for helping discover in terms of the staff members that contributed to that. So 95% of duodenal ulcers are Helicobacter pylori positive. That's a huge amount. So that's 19 out of 20 versus about 70% of those with gastric ulcers. So whenever we find um, an ulcer, we, whether it's um, you know, having complications like bleeding um, or if it's just causing some symptoms, we always check for Helicobacter pylori and then treat it if they're, if they're proven to have it. Those that have non anti-inflammatory drugs can really predispose to bleeding because they inhibit the usual healing processes that go on in the upper part of the GI tract. If you're using high dose of steroids, that also impairs that, uh, a similar pathway of healing. And so we often find for people that are on high dose steroids, which we do a lot in hematology and in critical care where I've worked before, we actually give them proton pump inhibitors, which has proven to reduce the effect of that causing ulcers. People that smoke also, uh, again, this idea of impairing, impaired healing process can have that. And those that are having severe illness, a lot of them are getting steroids, but the severe illness itself um, can contribute to ulcers. And then the role of alcohol is a little bit debatable because a lot of people that are using large amounts of alcohol will have some of those other things going on. Um, and those that have alcohol have other causes like Mallory Weiss tears that will contribute. So that's a bit debated at the moment. In terms of duodenal ulcers, this is happening in males a lot more of the time. We're talking um, a ratio of four to one. The peak incidence um, classically is in this kind of 30 to 50 age gap. So a lot of people coming in are in their kind of um, kind of just past that young adult phase towards middle-aged. Smoking rates double um, in duodenal ulcer patients compared to people that are, aren't smokers. And then in terms of genetics, um, that we think there is a genetic predisposition because those that have a first relative with duodenal ulcers have a triple relative risk uh, of getting a duodenal ulcer themselves, which is really interesting. Gastric ulcers, um, classically happening a bit later than the duodenal ulcers. Uh, NSAIDs will contribute to these a lot more. They increase your risk by about three to four times. And we think that genetics don't play as much role in the stomach as they do in the duodenum. The symptoms that you're probably very familiar with, burning, uh, this kind of gnawing epigastric pain, um, there's usually a relation to meals. Uh, so classically those that are um, gastric ulcers are the ones that when you're actually eating or just before you start eating because this burst of, of acid that's released, you have symptoms. Um, and the duodenal shortly after you've finished your meal as the contents of the stomach are passed in with acid into the first part of the duodenum. Having said that, um, both the literature and my own personal experience shows that this is really not clear cut. And there's a lot of people that have symptoms uh, that are attributable to an ulcer that are completely uh, uncorrelated with the time of their eating. So don't feel that that is like a necessary part of a diagnosis. A lot of people as well can get nocturnal symptoms when they're lying down and that the movement of the stomach acid will trigger those particular ulcers that presumably are more superior in the stomach. Um, a lot of these ulcers are asymptomatic, so if you were just to scope people generally, you would find a bunch of people that have no symptoms at all, but do have the ulcers that are there, which is really interesting. And then when things go bad, you can of course get penetration into an artery or even a vein, and that can cause hematemesis, particularly for arteries, and that's where you're vomiting up that blood because it's coming out so quickly. Or if it's coming out a bit slower, um, particularly in terms of venous bleeds, you can then have melina, as I said, as we've discussed, can be digested and passed out the other side. Investigation involves an upper GI endoscopy, also called a gastroscopy. We do H. pylori testing, which you can do in lots of different ways. So there's the urease breath test, which is pretty accurate. You can do serology on the blood, um, which uh, if they've had past infection may not be as clear. And you can even do antigen testing in the feces. Um, and if you're down there doing an endoscopy, you can do a biopsy and do a direct urease test, and that's a really accurate way of doing it. So most people that have any kind of ulcers will actually have a biopsy taken specifically for that urease test. In terms of when you have a biopsy in gastric ulcers particularly, 
we always mandate a biopsy. And why would that be, apart from the urease test? Right? It would be because a lot of gastric ulcers in particular are related to underlying malignancy. So you wanna make sure that that ulcer, even if it looks normal ones, because malignant ulcers do have a classic appearance, isn't kind of masking uh, an early development of adenocarcinoma or similar cancer underneath or to the side of that ulcer. In terms of management, the best thing is to modify risk factors. So we talked before, smoking, stop smoking. Uh, using NSAIDs, stop using NSAIDs. High dose steroids, have PPI cover or reduce the steroids. So there's lots of modifiable risk facts risk factors, and obviously if you have H. pylori, treating it will then reduce your chance of recurrence significantly. We then um, inhibit the acid, this is acutely and whilst during the healing phase, which is usually about eight weeks of treatment with a proton pump inhibitor, often at high doses initially and drop back later, and then as I said, treating the H. pylori. The complications, the main one you'll see is bleeding, causing anemia, and in bad cases, shock. Perforation is defined as uh, erosion into a cavity, so these ulcers themselves can actually perforate the, the stomach and you get gastric contents that then go into the stomach, ca um, the abdominal cavity causing peritonitis. That's a much less common complication compared to penetration. So penetration is defined as erosion into another structure. And so we talked about the idea of that structure being an artery or an arteriole or, or venule or similar. You can also get, as you get inflammation at the edge of the ulcers, in rare cases, that can actually obstruct the gastric outflow and then they can't actually absorb any of the food that they're having and they'll start vomiting and having a, a kind of a delayed dysphagia sort of picture. And then in terms of malignancy, um, it's rather than saying that's a complication of the ulcer, it's more um, uh, correct to say that cancers ulcerate rather than ulcers cancerate. In terms of bleeding peptic ulcers, um, you have to get onto it really quickly. So we talk about getting intravenous access and starting fluids, again, like whilst you're waiting to cross match that blood and get some. A lot of people say, what's a large bore cannula? Because that's the classic answer when you say, step one, get two large bore IV cannulas inserted. Um, if you're asked what that means, there's a whole range of gauges. If I'm wanting to get an actual large bore cannula, I'm talking about a 14 or a 12 gauge. And the 14 gauge, are the gray ones and the 12 gauge are the orange ones, which you often don't see outside of critical care areas in a hospital. What we, they're very difficult to put into people, if, particularly if they're peripherally shut down. So getting a um, 18 gauge, which is a green that you'll see very commonly, um, or a 20 gauge, which is a pink in, that can, is sometimes better than nothing. It can at least start resuscitating them. You're gonna send the blood for a cost match. At the same time, you're gonna check their hemoglobin, their platelets on a CBE. You're gonna check they don't have a coagulopathy, which most of them won't. Uh, using coagulation studies, um, checking their liver function tests, and checking their urea and creatinine as well to make sure they're not having acute kidney injury or require electrolyte replacement. You make them nil by mouth because you don't want anything that they could potentially could eat to um, trigger that ulcer to bleed further or in inhibit that healing process. You suppress the acid production with an intravenous proton pump inhibitor, classically pantoprazole, and then you arrange for an urgent upper GI endoscopy or if it fails, uh, a laparotomy or laparoscopy. So there's certain things that um, outside of the acute uh, region, if you see these red flags, you need to review, uh, refer them for quite urgent evaluation, potentially emergency or review in the, within a week or two. Uh, and that will usually necessitate endoscopy. So you're referring to a gastro specialist. So if a patient is over 50 and they have new onset of symptoms, we would be concerned that a malignancy can be contributing, therefore they need an endoscopy. Those that have dysphagia or trouble swallowing, that can indicate there could be a cancer of the esophagus that needs to be excluded via endoscopy. If you've got symptoms that are not relieved by appropriate treatment, as in proton pump inhibitors or, or lifestyle changes, then referring that because that may